Potawatomi Dow. I am Potawatomi. I am John Bursaw, legislative representative for District 4 of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. The land on which I stand is American Indian land. Since time immemorial, it has always been American Indian land. In 1825, the Kansa or Kaw were relocated to this reservation by treaty with the U.S. government, which included this property. 21 years later, they were relocated again to a reservation near Council Grove. In yet another treaty, the Potawatomi came to live on this land. These are my people. My family has lived in Kansas since 1838, 23 years before Kansas became a state. Earlier, we had been removed from our homelands under armed guard. We did not want to come. We only had one choice, the choice to survive. This video is a brief history of the Potawatomi, their forced relocation to Kansas, their experiences at the Potawatomi Baptist Manual Labor School between 1848 and 1861, and the post-mission period. The exterior has been restored to its original 1850 appearance. For many centuries, the Potawatomi lived in what is now eastern Canada and northern Maine. They called themselves Nishnabe, or the original or true people. The Potawatomi were known as the Keeper of the Fire. An early tribal prophecy directed the tribe to move away from the coast or it would be destroyed. This led to their migration to the Great Lakes region. In 1634, the Potawatomi encountered the white man for the first time near Green Bay, Wisconsin. This soon led to the establishment of a successful fur trade partnership between the French and the Potawatomi. To ensure a lasting alliance, French men were allowed to marry Potawatomi women. As a result, today, numerous Potawatomi families have French surnames. During this period, as with most Great Lakes tribes, the Potawatomi lived in bark houses called wigwams. The sides were built of saplings, and roofs were either birch bark or woven cattails. Throughout this period, the Potawatomi were a principal tribe in the Great Lakes area with land holdings of over 500 million acres. But life began to change for the Potawatomi in the mid-1700s. They allied first with the French in a war against the British, and later with the British against the Americans in the Revolutionary War. The biggest impact, however, was America's thirst for land. At this time, more than 80% of Americans engaged in farming. Combined with the growing belief of manifest destiny, Native Americans were constantly being forced to sign treaties selling their land. In 1830, under the direction of President Andrew Jackson, Congress passed a devastating bill for hundreds of thousands of American Indians. The Indian Removal Act mandated all eastern tribes to sell their land at rates set by the U.S. government and resettle west of the Mississippi River, mainly to what would become the states of Kansas and Oklahoma. The Potawatomi vehemently opposed leaving their homelands. Leaders struggled to prevent the sale of their lands, but government influences were too powerful. In 1838, one band of Potawatomi was tricked into a meeting with government officials in Twin Lakes, Indiana. They were informed of their immediate relocation to what would become the state of Kansas. Soldiers were sent out as far as 30 miles to forcibly remove other Potawatomi from their homes and bring them to Twin Lakes. Their homes, crops, and businesses were burned to ensure they had nothing to return to. What followed became known as the Potawatomi Trail of Death. On September 4, 1838, more than 850 men, women, and children left Twin Lakes, Indiana, near present-day South Bend, mostly on foot. The trail ended at what is now Osawatomi, Kansas, on November 4, 1838. During the 660-mile journey, more than 40 people died, mostly elders and children, and an additional 60 were able to escape. The first Potawatomi reservations in Kansas were in what are now Miami and Lynn counties. A promise of housing at the end of the trail proved false, resulting in great hardship. 
Over the next eight years, over 600 Potawatomi would die on the Sugar Creek Reservation, primarily of cholera, and were buried in unmarked graves. The federal government negotiated the treaties, but gave much of the work to force Native Americans to live as white people did by converting them to Western culture and religion. The denominations competed for federal dollars to build and operate missions. Baptists, Catholics, Methodists, and Presbyterians all established missions in Kansas. The Treaty of 1846 relocated the Potawatomi to the newly created Potawatomi Reserve, a 900-square-mile reservation straddling the Kansas River in northeast Kansas. Another group of Potawatomi, known as the Prairie Band Potawatomi, located on a reservation near Council Bluffs, Iowa, were also moved there for a combined population of 3,300. Only a ramshackle log house stood on this site when Baptist missionaries Johnston Likens, Eliza McCoy, and Robert and Fanny Simmerwell arrived. They had worked with the Potawatomi in Michigan. Construction of the Potawatomi Baptist Manual Labor School began in 1848. The federal government provided $5,000 for the building, paid teachers and laborers salaries, and provided an annual $50 per pupil allowance. Superintendent Johnston Likens submitted this building plan to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs in 1849. It is the only known architectural record of the building. The first floor was for cooking and dining, and on the second floor were classrooms and living quarters for the missionaries. The third floor, or garret, was sleeping quarters. Boys and girls had separate facilities on all three floors. Constructed of locally quarried Burlingame limestone, the walls stand two feet thick on the first floor. In 1850, the mission's peak year, 91 students ages 4 to 20 boarded here along with eight staff members. Except for Saturdays, days at the mission were highly regimented. This was quite an adjustment for children not accustomed to a life dictated by a clock. Built as a manual labor school, students learned skills and occupations to help them assimilate into white society, in addition to reading, writing, and arithmetic. Girls learned to cook, bake, wash and iron clothes, make candles, process meats, and practice needlework. Boys worked in the fields, fed and cared for cattle, cut wood, built fences, and learned blacksmithing. It is difficult to piece together a picture of mission life from the children's viewpoint since the only written records were created by missionaries or other white people. And the missionaries were motivated to only report good news so they would continue to receive government and church funds. I never saw white children who excelled them in letters and but few that would equal them in sewing and fancy work. Eliza McCoy, Teacher, 1851. The children are comfortably clad and fed, and appear to be happy and contented. I saw them play at marbles on Saturday, several of them, and they showed themselves thorough professionals. Lewis Henry Morgan, visitor to the mission, 1859. We do know the children experienced a dramatic change in lifestyle upon arriving at the mission. As part of the missionaries' efforts to make students conform to white society, Children could not speak their native language. Clothing was replaced and their hair cut. Names of church benefactors were bestowed on unsuspecting children as a way of recognizing the benefactor's contributions. This was common at Native American mission schools. The government's plan to isolate the Potawatomi was undermined by several events. The Oregon-California Trail passed within a mile of the mission. The immigrants pass here every day. 5,000 head of cattle pass this morning. Robert Simmerwell's blacksmith shop provided hardware and tools for the mission. He also repaired wagons for passers-by on the Oregon-California Trail. In 1849, gold fever had a serious impact on life at the mission. Supplies became expensive and scarce as immigrants stocked up for the trip to California. Hired help left the mission to join passing wagon trains. Without hired help, 
students and teachers, like Fanny Simmerwell, spent less time in the classroom and more time in the kitchen and on the farm. Travelers also brought deadly diseases like cholera and smallpox. The mission struggled to remain open through the 1850s, even closing temporarily in 1855 due to funding problems. The final blow came late in 1861. Years of infighting in the Baptist Church polarized northern and southern factions. The Southern Baptist Convention operated the mission at the time of its closure. The outbreak of the Civil War exhausted funds otherwise earmarked for missionary work. In 1860, approximately 2,200 Potawatomi were living on the Potawatomi Reserve. By 1863, 1,400 took allotments. The remaining 800 moved to the Diminished Reserve, or Prairie Band Reservation, to the north in present-day Jackson County. During the Civil War, the mission stood vacant. The Baptists failed in a brief attempt to reopen it after the war. In 1873, Robert Ives Lee acquired 320 acres formerly belonging to the Baptist Home Mission Society. A native of Boston, he purchased the lands to raise fine trotting racehorses and converted the mission into a barn. Lee constructed a large two-story home of native stone to the north of the mission. The old roof was replaced with a new gambrel style in 1933. Converting the mission into a barn destroyed much of the original structure, including evidence of fireplaces and living quarters. The land went through several owners before 1974, when 81 acres were purchased by the state of Kansas. The purpose was to restore this historic building and use the grounds for construction of the new Kansas Museum of History. An archaeological excavation of the site was followed by extensive restoration of the building. Having been a barn for a hundred years and a mission for only thirteen, little remained from that early time period. These are a few of the items recovered. During the restoration project, as much of the original fabric was retained as possible, including graffiti that could have been written during the mission period. Much of the stone exterior walls were rebuilt. All of the floors are new, as is the entire top floor and monitor roof. Today, the mission is used for living history programs, an exhibit gallery, and educational classrooms. Despite the efforts to separate the Potawatomi from their native culture, the Potawatomi have endeavored to preserve many of their traditions. Some live on the Prairie Band Reservation, and others do not. Although much has changed in the last 150 years, one thing remained the same. When they came to Kansas, they made the choice to survive. And they have. <laughs>